Hello, scholars and saints. Hope that you're doing well. It is Saturday when I'm um, recording this, and uh, we are basically on fall break. I think that's the the new name. It used to be Thanksgiving break. We're calling fall break, which there used to be a fall break in October, and that just disappeared. So I think we need to get that back. And like, we can still call this fall break, but fall break too, I guess. Or, you know, maybe something like autumn harvest or winter harvest. Is it winter yet? I don't know. Um, so today I am going to read the introduction. It's just a few pages from Ayn Rand's The Virtue of Selfishness. I think she, I read this, read it this morning and I think she does a really good job of just explaining kind of the purpose of the book and the title. So uh, this is a book that is a collection of essays that originally appeared in the monthly journal that she created and edited and published with some other people such as Nathaniel Brandon. And uh, they're mostly from the 60s, from the early 60s. That journal was called the Objectivist Newsletter. And there are, there are some essays from Nathaniel Brandon, but yeah, it's just, it's just him and Ayn Rand, mostly Ayn Rand. The first essay after the introduction is the objectivist ethic so i think it would be a really good book to get if you want to know about that but at the end of at least all of my editions of ayn rand books there's always well is there maybe there isn't actually maybe i am lying okay i'm lying <laughs> i thought there uh, well in some of the books there are there's like an overview of her entire philosophy, but okay, never mind. It's, I don't know where you can find that, I guess, <laughs> and, and can't. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. And I'm reading from this because in about, I guess, a week, um, a little longer than a week, I'm going to co-host a talk at my college with a colleague of mine and we're just going over Ayn Rand uh, because we think that we can draw an audience I guess and um, she suggested it and I agreed because I had read a bit of her in my political economy class like earlier in the semester and so that's what I'm going to be doing this fall break is reading as much as I can. I finished Anthem yesterday, uh, which very much has 1984 vibes. And I liked it. You can finish it in like a couple of hours. All right, so let's start. The title of this book, which is The Virtue of Selfishness. So you think, is selfishness a virtue? Usually, if someone calls you selfish, you will... Um, well, most people would be offended and insulted, and I don't know how they would take that. <laughs> the title of this book may evoke the kind of question that I hear once in a while. Why do you use the word selfishness to denote virtuous qualities of character when that word antagonizes so many people to whom it does not mean the things you mean? To those who ask it, my answer is, for the reason that makes you afraid of it. But there are others who would not ask that question, sensing the moral cowardice it implies, yet who are unable to formulate my actual reason or to identify the profound moral issue involved, it is to them that I will give a more explicit answer. It is not a mere semantic issue nor a matter of arbitrary choice. The meaning ascribed in popular usage to the word selfishness is not merely wrong, it represents a devastating intellectual package deal which is responsible more than any other factor for the arrested moral development of mankind. In popular use, the word selfishness is a synonym of evil, 
The image it conjures is of a murderous brute who tramples over piles of corpses to achieve his own ends. I mean, I'm not sure that everyone thinks that, but okay. Who cares for no living being and pursues nothing but the gratification of the mindless whims of any immediate moment. Yet the exact meaning and dictionary definition of the word selfishness is concern with one's own interests. I mean, I think, you know, and my experience is going to be as everyone's experience might be, uh, or probably is, yeah, that means the same thing, um, uh, unique. But I can see uh, her point. I think when it comes to advice and suggestions and opinions, we really do have to take what resonates with us and then kind of shelve the rest. Not all advice is great for everybody, right? Uh, some people are too much this and not enough this, and other people are the inverse. And so those two groups of people, if you can reduce anything to two groups, uh, any virtue or vice, they're going to have almost opposite the opposite advice will work for them, right? So in my perspective, oh my gosh, is that a little black cat that's outside? So cute. I saw recently like an Instagram that said, oh my gosh, is it going? It's going like beneath. Something, I don't know what, what we call it, but... Like there's a little hole under the curb. I saw on my Instagram reels that if a cat, like cats choose you. So if you see a cat, maybe it's like, I don't know, it's supposed to be yours. But that is so crazy. Okay, um, so in my experience with manipulative narcissistic people, that word selfish has been used to manipulate and try to shame and control and to guilt. Um, for instance, you know, you might decide that as an adult, you want to move away to a different state than your parents live in. And they might say, you are selfish because you should, you are obligated, it's your duty, you should, love us enough or however they want to put it um to stay around your family and take care of us in case we need you and what if you have kids i'll never get to see my grandparents you know all these things but if you go off because you don't want to live in you know wherever you were born you want to travel the world you want to experience a new place that's more in alignment with you and your vision that's selfish and you shouldn't do it And so in that sense, it's more empowering to say, okay, well, if I am selfish, then, then that's, that's great that I'm going to be selfish and, and do that because I choose myself in that instance. So that's just one example that has similarly happened to me, not just when I wanted to move away, but when I wanted to you know, go to Europe for a while, or, you know, I was told specifically by my parents and then by someone else that was in my life that I was selfish for leaving them. But, you know, Ayn Rand says that when compassion and kindness are policed and they're obligated and you're a monster, if you don't sacrifice yourself for others continuously i mean it's hard to say always do this and never do this because i think there are people you know not everyone thank goodness is um a bad person and uh you know it depends what kind of relationship 
you're in and if you want to be in that relationship then you want to be a good friend in that relationship and if you don't want to be a relationship in the relationship you're not a bad friend for not showing up because you don't even want to be in the relationship right and so you should just be able to to say that and and then that relationship ends um and we want to foster compassion and kindness in ourselves but when we're talking about people who want to control us and want to manipulate us and are abusive psychologically and so on it's actually detrimental to everybody if we don't choose ourselves and we don't act selfishly and as she says you know the word just think it's selfish if i was you know peckish then i would be kind of hungry right so it doesn't even mean that you are self-obsessed or self-absorbed it's it just means that you're kind of also considering and listening to your own needs you're kind of about the self you're selfish i mean i don't know Etymologically, that's what ish means, right? Or usually that's how, you know, I'm hungry-ish. I'm happy-ish, you know? You're not that happy if you're happy-ish. So uh, so the word has just been sort of co-opted, I think. And again, you know, I mean, like, alternatively, of course... I don't think this means or it should mean that if someone says, you know, if someone you trust and love is pointing out, you act quite selfishly. I'm never saying that you should not reflect on that, but you should just keep in mind who's saying it to you and why. An authentic person is a person who cannot be controlled. And I think Ayn Rand speaks from some kind of similar pain and trauma. Um, I'm also reading Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged at the same time, kind of. I started both of them today, so I'm not very far. But I was listening to a live stream on the Ayn Rand Institute that was talking about Jordan Peterson's comments on Ayn Rand. And did I ever say, okay, never mind. <laughs> we'll just go with that. Um, and uh, I think one of the comments was, and I didn't hear this from Jordan Peterson, someone just said that he called all of Ayn Rand's characters psychopaths. And I can see see that reading in a sense um these characters in both of the books uh there's at least one character who uh, people around them are disappointed in them because they don't seem to be quote showing human emotions um but i don't but I see those characters as, like, maybe that's something that Ayn Rand has been told before. Like, you're cold. You don't seem to have human emotions. And, uh, you know, obviously, again, we don't want to go to the extreme and not be able to make intimate connections with others. But the characters that the main characters are talking to that want the main characters to, quote, have emotion. Um, I think that Ayn Rand, just coming from my own experiences and so giving her the benefit of the doubt. Is that, is that how you say it? Benefit of the doubt? I don't know. Um, I always wonder that when I say it because it sounds awkward. But I think that those people are trying to get a reaction out of somebody. Like, for instance, in Fountainhead, it's about this student who's 22 who just got expelled from architecture school, and he's renting a room in a house, and the lady landlord 
uh, is sitting on the porch and kind of sees this guy coming up the steps and she is really excited and she almost seems kind of like um, triumphant because she says that she knows what, what it, what's happened and she said your dean called and she is it Rand like writes her as being kind of excited to see him break down and be vulnerable and be affected right like she is saying uh, you would think that if someone just got expelled and then the dean calls you personally um, it might stir up this emotion, whether you want it to be good news or you think it's going to be like more bad news, etc. But the way she, the way Rand writes the scene is as if the landlady wants a performance. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and when the guy, the main character, doesn't give her a performance and he he kind of like acts indifferent, she is like disappointed. So there's, there wasn't empathy coming from, coming towards the main character in the first place. So why would we call it psychopathic if, you know, that empathy wasn't returned? So, uh, so is it that, well, in her books, is it that people are being, are lacking human emotion? Are, are just lacking emotion or are they lacking the right desired emotion that the person wants them to have because they enjoy the performance because they controlled how someone felt so i think we really when we're reading rand we really need to take what she says with a grain of salt and understand that she's most likely coming from a place of pain and trauma. And what she says can actually be inspiring to people who have come from a place of trauma and pain to give them courage to be selfish, to be a bad person, and go their own way, you know, leave the town, go no contact with people, you know, um, you do what you want to do. But Rand also says, like, she's not saying do that and step all over people and don't care about their thoughts. Like she says several times, and she'll say in this chapter, a person who acts selfishly, rationally selfishly, doesn't sacrifice themselves and also doesn't sacrifice others. Like she always mentions that this is not a selfishness. I mean, I guess I'm kind of just telling you what it says, but I'll, I'll continue reading in a second. But she makes a distinction. She says, this isn't a selfishness because of a whim or a pleasure. Um, you know, because there there is, of course, a selfishness that is, you know, no one's going to like you if you are like that. And it is a character flaw. Um, if you're just, you know, in a silly childish way, kind of. And she says, furthermore, like children can't be rationally selfish. If they're selfish, they're going to be irrationally selfish because it takes a certain level of consciousness and awareness, right? But you could be selfish that you always, uh, you know, I don't know, take the last um, whatever it is from the fridge and you live with other people and you don't care. Like you don't, you never like leave it for them or you never ask them if you can have it. You're just, you're always the one that's taking and uh, never giving. Like, yeah, of course, you know, if you're choosing, if you're electing to live with people, then you need to be considerate. If you're choosing to be around other people, it's great to be considerate. Um, so, so I don't know. I mean, where Rand, though, does become problematic is when we take literally and, uni and apply universally what she says. Because I think it gets, I, although I think that Rand is quite inspiring individually and personally in terms of one's own freedom 
in the face of potentially toxic, unhealthy relationships, I don't think it's super helpful when you're talking about healthy relationships or you're talking about a complex society where people, where, where there's a vast uh, inequality among the people for, through no choice of their own. You know, we're kind of thrown into the world and not everyone has a good chance. I feel like in that situation, leaning toward compassion and a little bit of selflessness is, is really important. So when I read Rand, I read her for what I can take positively, but, but absolutely it's, it's impossible for me not to see what's incredibly problematic because, you know, to some extent, we want to evolve past this self-protective shell and be able to be open and trusting and compassionate, etc. Um, you know, and it's with the right people we have to be discriminating. Even the Bible says, don't throw your pearls before swine. I'm sending you out as if among wolves. So be as innocent as a dove, but as, what is it? Stealth as a ser serpent? What, what is the word? As, what's that word? As what as a serpent? Wise as a serpent? I think maybe it says wise. Um, so, you know, even, even the Jesus said, uh, you know, and also Jesus at 12, like left his parents or stayed behind because he wanted to like, listen and talk to the people. So, um, you know, I think it's, I think we have to be very nuanced in our reading and in our application and in our advice. This concept does not include a moral evaluation. It does not tell us whether concern with one's own interests is good or evil. It does, nor does it tell us what constitutes man's actual interest. It is the task of ethics to answer such questions. The ethics of altruism has created the image of the brute. So I think she's saying that uh, you know, selfishness is used in kind of a non-nuanced way where it's always bad, but it's not always bad. The ethics of altruism has created the image of the brute as its answer in order to make men accept two inhuman tenets. That any concern with one's own interests is evil, regardless of what these interests might be. And I think that's the important point. She... Uh, she wants to create space, and this is where I think she's being helpful. She wants to create space for productive, healthy, like, boundaries, <laughs> I think. And B, that the brute's activities are in fact to one's own interest, which altruism enjoins man to renounce for the sake of his neighbors. So she's going to argue that people who are... Um, said to be selfish and you know in some way I, this is what i would say deserve it she's saying that those people are not even if they're acting irrationally selfish they're actually not acting in their own best interest because they're going to be ousted from society basically for a view of the nature so so basically she's saying everyone who uses this word is just like all, you know, turned around. For a view of the nature of altruism, its consequences and the enormity of the moral corruption it perpetuates, I shall refer you to Atlas Shrugged. There she goes with her self reference. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying she's, she's got her own problems, okay? <laughs> or to any overconfidence, maybe, or to any of the today's newspaper headlines. What concerns us here is altruism's default in the field of ethical theory. 
There are two moral questions which altruism lumps together into one package deal. One, what are values? Two, who should be the beneficiary of values? Altruism substitutes the second for the first. It evades the task of defining a code of moral values, thus leaving man, in fact, without moral guidance. So if it's so reduced to don't be selfish, that means you should sacrifice your what you want, your desires, to be considerate or compassionate or what else, whatever to someone else. So to be not selfish, it's always to direct away from the self. And we can see how that idea of morality would be problematic. You know, to what extent? When? There are all of these conditions of appropriateness, as per Aristotle and the Nicomachean Ethics. Altruism declares that any action taken for the benefit of others is good, and any action taken for one's own benefit is evil. So do people who point out when other people are being selfish, are they taking this extreme view? I would say probably not. <laughs> um, but, you know, she's talking about it like if you logically extend, you know, what you might be implying, then that's where you should go. Thus, the beneficiary of an action is the only... So, so basically, like, I'm not, I'm not giving the advice to dismiss when people, like, point out something about us. <laughs> like, we should not... We should think about it. But again... Who's saying it? And why? Thus, the beneficiary of an action is the only criterion of moral value. And so long as that beneficiary is anybody other than, the, and, than oneself, anything goes. Hence, the appalling immorality, the chronic injustice, the grotesque double standards, the insoluble conflicts and contradictions that have characterized human relationships and human societies throughout history under all the variants of the altruistic ethics. I mean, I don't know. I hesitate to embrace her anti-altruism sort of line of thinking. Um, I don't think that... I don't know. I mean, what what is the actual definition of altruism? Doing something for someone else without any ulterior motive. And I purely am taking that definition from the episode of Friends where Phoebe is is trying to figure it out. <laughs> so <laughs> that's where if you want to know, that's where my mind goes. I'm like, what did Phoebe say? How did she define it? I think that's how she defined it. Um because I think someone was like saying, well, there, there's no actual altruistic um, action. And then like, did they find like a, like a finger in a Coke kit? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that was somehow a part of that episode. Um, okay. Hence, okay, no, I already read that. Observe the indecency of what passes for moral judgments today. An industrialist who produces a fortune and a gangster who robs a bank are regarded as equally immoral since they both sought wealth for their own selfish benefit. I mean, see here, I think I think Ayn Rand can get a little bit reductionist and, and like narrow focused. I mean, I, I would like to know more about this gangster. I mean, is it, does it have to be a gangster? I mean, that's kind of loaded language right there. An industrialist who produces a fortune, I mean, could be immoral depending on, like, I would, I need to know more of the story, but I feel like she's just kind of making blanket statements, which if she didn't do that, she might be a little more persuasive. It, it lacks nuance. A young man who gives up his career in order to support his parents and never rises beyond the rank of grocery clerk is regarded as morally superior to the young man who endures an excruciating struggle and achieves personal ambition. I mean, that example reminds me of Sartre's... I can't remember if it was in Being in Nothingness or existentialism is a humanism but most people 
most people know about it. It's the his example of, you know, who can he, who can a young soldier who or a young person who wants to go off to war, you know, but has to decide whether to follow his the duty of sacrificing his, you know, potentially his future in the war versus staying with his parent. Um, you know, Sartre says you have to decide for yourself. It reminds me of that. Um, a dictator is regarded as moral since the unspeakable atrocities he committed were intended to benefit the people, not himself. And see, I like, who? <laughs> who would say that? <laughs> who would say, oh yeah, that dictator was moral. I, I, I don't know. Like some of her examples are better than others. Observe what this beneficiary criterion of morality does to a man's life. The first thing he learns is that morality is his enemy. He has nothing to gain from it. He can only lose. Self-inflicted loss, self-inflicted pain, and the great debilitating pall of an incomprehensible duty is all that he can expect. He may hope that others might occasionally sacrifice themselves for his benefit as he grudgingly sacrifices himself for theirs, but he knows that the relationship will bring mutual resentment, not pleasure, and that morally, their pursuit of values will be like an exchange of unwanted, unchosen Christmas presents, I just found that hilarious. <laughs> which neither is morally permitted to buy for himself. Apart from such times as he manages to perform some act of self-sacrifice, he possesses no moral significance. Morality takes no cognizance of him and has nothing to say to him for guidance in the crucial issues of his life. It is only his personal, private, selfish life, and as such, it is regarded as evil or, at best, immoral. So it's basically like, how can you, and it's kind of like a classic philosophical argument, What's more important? Is it the motivation or is it the commitment to the duty? Um, so Kant would say that you can't predict consequences, so you should just always act along the guidelines of your moral code. And I feel that, you know, Rand in a way, is critiquing this because Kant, by saying that, um, sorry, I was trying to think of what we, we call it, deontological ethics, um, that takes away the what Rand loves, which is the thinking person, thinking for yourself. You know, kind of following your duty can kind of be seen as blind you're not taking into consideration the situation and how your feelings and your evolved knowledge. Um, a person who has a strong commitment to their duty and like never does X and always does Y can kind of seem a little cold and calculating, right? But then there's the other, so there's the other um, category like virtue ethics. So maybe you can't, I think it's virtue ethics, you can't, uh, well, what matters is the motivation. What matters is your, how you feel, your rationality, did you do it for a good reason, you know, what was your intention? And of course, then I think of like the verse that says like good intentions lead to hell or something. <laughs> so like is the bible deontological i don't know um so you know i think she wants some con some conscious thought behind any sort of decision because that's what she says rationality will save us that's her thing since nature does not provide man with an automatic form of survival, since he has to support his life by his own effort, the doctrine that concern with one's own interests is evil means that man's desire is to desire to live is evil, that man's life as such is evil. No doctrine could be more evil than that. So I guess she's saying her argument here is that 
we have to, to a certain extent, I would say to a certain extent, um, need to think about our own needs because, you know, we care about living. Yet that is the meaning of altruism, implicit in such examples as the equation of an industrialist with a robber. There is a fundamental moral difference between a man who sees his self-interest in production and a man who sees it in robbery. Sorry, just one second. Okay, sorry about that. The evil of a robber does not lie in the fact that he pursues his own interests, but in what he regards as to his own interest. Not in the fact that he pursues his values, but in what he chose to value. Not in the fact that he wants to live, but in the fact that he wants to live on a subhuman level. See the objectivist ethics, which is the next. Or the first actual essay. I just think Rand here, when she's... Um, comparing the robber and the industrialist is making some assumptions. She's making assumptions that the industrialist didn't try to exploit other people, and she is making an assumption about the robber that there was another more rational way to get money to get food or whatever it is, right? Like the I just feel that we have to critique her here for the assumptions that she's making. And that would be something good to put in an essay if you were doing an analysis of this. If it is true that what I mean by selfishness is not what is meant conventionally, then this is one of the worst indictments of alt altruism. It means that altruism permits no concept of a self-respecting, self-supporting man, a man who supports his life by his own effort and neither sacrifices himself nor others. So there we go. That's what I was mentioning. Like she admires and suggests, that's, that's her moral selfishness. So if she feels like selfishness is moral and a big part of that morality is that we're not sacrificing others as well. It means that altruism permits no view of men except as sacrificial animals and profiteers on sacrifice, as victims and parasites, that it permits no concept of a benevolent coexistence among men, that it permits no concept of justice. So you can't have justice and you can't really have benevolence if it's kind of like saying that you can't love someone if you fear them, you know? They may be controlling you by fear, and then you respond in an inauthentic way that's like loving, quote unquote, or positive, quote unquote, but it's not actual love because you can't have love when you are fearing. So I think that's what she's kind of trying to say. And I think that we just really need to keep in mind, I mean, one thing we can ask ourselves is why altruism? What does that mean? Dictionary definition, what does it mean to her? Why is she calling it out? I think she's calling out a very specific use of the virtue of, of altruism. If she could be a little more nuanced in trying to define that particular use of it, I mean, I think to some extent she is, um, like she is being pretty specific in her description, but just by using that word, I, I would just love her to say, I don't know, I would just love her to say more about when altruism is helpful or when selfishness is problematic. Although, again, like I guess she, she kind of does, right? Because she's saying that it's not a selfishness among, you know, that's based on a whim. It's not a selfishness that sacrifices others. So, I mean, I guess she's trying to. 
If you wonder about the reasons behind the ugly mixture of cynicism and guilt in which most men spend their lives, I'm like, I don't, I'm not sure that's true either. These are the reasons. Cynicism because they neither practice nor accept the altruistic, the altruist morality. Guilt because they dare not reject it. So she kind of sees people as, or she's critiquing people when they act morally, but they're like secretly resentful. It's kind of the, the thing where if, you know, someone is angry at you for doing what you want, but they're angry because they wish that they had the courage to do it as well, right? It's like someone who is really upset that you didn't attend a meeting, but they're really upset they're really only upset because they actually didn't want to go to the meeting and they like felt like they sacrificed their own desires for the meeting and therefore everyone else should do that too. And maybe no one show up at the meeting and then whoever held, whoever like created the meeting will realize that it could be an email. Okay, that's just, that's just my millennial perspective. To rebel against so devastating an evil, one has to rebel against its basic premise. To redeem both man and morality is the concept of selfishness that one, it is the concept of selfishness that one has to redeem. The first step is to assert man's right to a moral existence. That is to recognize his need of a moral code to guide the course and the fulfillment of his life. For a brief outline of the nature and the validation of irrational morality, see my lecture on the objectivist ethics which follows. The reasons why man needs a moral code will tell you that the purpose of morality is to define man's proper values and interests. That concern with his, his own interests is the essence of a moral existence and that man must be the beneficiary of his own moral actions. So, you can't completely disregard the self, and there's this word proper, which means that Rand does make value judgments. She wants freedom for everyone, but she is going to make a value judgment on whether you are being rational or not. Since all, the val since all values have to be gained and or kept by men's actions, any breach between actor and beneficiary necessitates an injustice. The sacrifice of some men to others, of the actors to the non-actors, of the moral to the immoral, nothing could ever justify such a breach, and no one ever has. So it's the direction of the sacrifice... So if the moral is sacrificing to the immoral, does that still make it more, whatever they're sacrificing moral? Just because they're sacrificing it. But who and why are you sacrificing it? The choice of the beneficiary of moral values is merely a preliminary or introductory issue in the field of morality. It is not a substitute for morality, nor a criterion of moral value as altruism has made it. Neither is it a moral primary. It has to be derived from and validated by the fundamental premises of a moral system. The objectivist ethics, and I think this is a really important uh, statement, holds that the actor must always be the beneficiary of his action and that man must act for his own rational self-interest. And the word rational is italicized. But his right to do so is derived from his nature as man and from the function of moral values in human life and therefore is applicable only in the context of a rational, objectively demonstrated and validated code of moral principles which define and determine his actual self-interest. It is not a license to do as he pleases, and it is not applicable to the altruist image of a selfish brute, nor to any man motivated by irrational emotions, feelings, urges, wishes, or whims. So I think she would, so she's saying she, does, she would critique someone who is acting, um, recklessly just as they please or based on whims it has to be something that's a decision that is intentional 
and well thought out and actually does have a benefit to the self and perhaps to others. I mean, maybe, I mean, we could say that we are acting selfishly when we tell someone no, but maybe it's helping ourselves because we are saying no and that no is truthful. Like we don't want to do or go or be or whatever it is that we're saying no to. Um, but also we're helping the other person because we're, we're letting them see where we stand with them. And also maybe we're not enabling certain dysfunctional dynamics or behaviors between, you know, ourselves and that other person or just in that other person's life. This is said as a warning against the kind of Nietzschean egoists who in fact are a product of the altruist morality. Her, her, her opinion of Nietzsche is really interesting. Like why, it's like she wants to like, she does like some of what he says, but like overall, like she thinks he's just like a little bit misguided. <laughs> and represent the, who, okay, so who in fact are a product of the altruist morality and represent the other side of the altruist coin. The men who believe that any action, regardless of its nature, is good if it is intended for one's own benefit. Just as the satisfaction of the irrational desires of others is not a criterion of moral value. Oh, I like that. I did not. Hmm. Reading something a second time. The satisfaction of the irrational desires of others is not a criterion of moral value. Neither is the satisfaction of one's own irrational desires. Morality is not a contest of whims. See Mr. Brandon's articles, Counterfeit Individualism and Isn't Everyone Selfish, which follow. Oh, that sounds interesting. A similar type of error is committed by the man who declares that since man must be guided by his own independent judgment, any action he chooses to take is moral if he chooses it. I wonder if that's like a nod to Sartre. One's own independent judgment is the means by which one must choose one's actions, but it is not a moral criterion nor a moral validation. Only reference to a demonstra demonstrable principle can validate one's choices. So one's choices still need validation. Just as man, I guess by the self, just as man cannot survive by any random means, but must discover and practice the principles which his survival requires, so man's self-interest cannot be determined by blind desires or random whims, but must be discovered and achieved by the guidance of rational principles. This is why the objectivist ethics is a morality of rational self-interest or of rational selfishness. My thought, though, is that what is rational is to some extent not objective, but very subjective. And I know this because, or I think this, because when Rand explains in what is, in, well, it's capitalism, the unknown ideal, she says, like, she tries to give examples and explains what is rational and what isn't. I feel like it's just a measure. It's just like, it depends on one's own subjective thought and thinking. You could rationalize what she's calling irrational. So, or you could argue or defend what she says is, ir is irrational as being rational. And a lot of times when there are philosophers who are rationalists and they, this happens a lot when people, when philosophers are trying to defend the existence of, or prove the existence of God and they say, well, I have proven this on the basis of my logic and reason. I'm like, well, I don't know if you did. Like, you know, I'm like, you said you did, but I mean, that doesn't make it so... So I don't know. And that's, you know, in her whole philosophy, that's why it's called objectivist philosophy, 
but uh, I just think if you are a human being, it's to some extent always going to be subjective. Since selfishness is concern with one's interests, the objectivist ethics uses that concept in its exact and in purest sense. It is not a concept that one can surrender to man's enemies, nor to the unthinking misconceptions, distortions, prejudices, and fears of the ignorant and irrational. The attack on selfishness is an attack on man's self-esteem. To surrender one is to surrender the other. I think that's really interesting that she's talking about self-esteem. I mean, what she means by self-esteem, I would think would be self-worth maybe self-love self-confidence um i don't know now a word about the material in this book with the exception of the lecture on ethics it is a collection of essays that have appeared in the objectivist newsletter a monthly journal of ideas edited and published by nathaniel brandon and myself the newsletter deals with the application of the philosophy of objectivism to the issues and problems of today's culture. And more specifically, with that intermediate level of intellectual concern which lies between philosophical abstractions and the journalistic concretes of day-by-day of -day existence. Its purpose is to provide its readers with a consistent philosophical frame of reference. This Collection is not a systematic discussion of ethics, but a series of ethics, essays on those ethical subjects which needed clarification in today's context or which had been most confused by altruism's influence. You may observe that the titles of some of the essays are in the form of a question. These come from our intellectual ammunition department that answers questions sent in by our readers. <laughs> That's a hilarious name. Intellectual ammunition department. <laughs> it's just just like why so much drama rant i don't know and then it says p.s nathaniel brandon is no longer associated with me with my philosophy or the objectivist i mean is that a burn did something happen so i don't know okay i think the another book that i think in the capitalism book it said that too at the beginning or at the end and i, I thought the same thing i was like how does nathaniel brandon think about that because i know that nathaniel brandon has like he has been interviewed you could see it as an interview on youtube he speaks very well of her he wrote a whole book that i haven't read or i don't have as well but um that's called my life with rand so you know and i mean they were lovers for a time so i think him being the younger person is just kind of like what you know hana arendt with heidegger they're always in a way you know they were groomed and uh so they're always going to, even though they recognize the toxicity and the dynamic, they're always maybe going to be a little bit enamored of the older person that groomed them. And yes, I will use that word because that is what happens. Um, all right. Thank you, everyone. And I will catch you later. Thanks for staying with me for this long. If you did, um, I know. I kind of spoke in the beginning for like 20 minutes. So I didn't realize I was doing that. Um, but yeah, I think we'll have more videos on Rand. I might do a video on Anthem and just like all the books I'm reading this week. So let me know if that interests you. See you. Have a great day.